they agree to a three-year term. Okay, so this is this is definitely escalating because, of course, the original thing I heard was a hundred pounds. <laughs> no, this was this was just released by, uh, like I said, by Reuters, and the second leg is to deposit one point four tons for up to for between uh, three and fifteen years. But the but the catch is is that the temple has said we'll do that, but we don't want money, we want gold. <laughs> so they're they're giving they're giving a lot of pushback. Here's the opening paragraph: the world's richest Hindu temple is asking to be repaid in gold for longer term deposits it makes under the Indian government's monetization scheme in order to make the plan more attractive to the temples that are sitting on thousands of tons of metal. The Swami temple, popularly known as uh, Tiratupa, has requested repayment of their deposits on longer than three years under the gold monetization scheme in the metal rather than cash, the executive director told Reuters on Wednesday. That's so if it's more than three years, we want metal. We don't want your we don't want your rupees because they're worthless. And I want to read this last part, and then you can then you can uh, reply if you would. Sure. Since the temple will deposit, now wait a minute. Uh, TTD, which there is the temple, last month deposited 1.3 tons of gold with the state-run national bank at a rate of 1.75 percent for three years. And then the temple will deposit another 1.4 tons in a fortnight at 1.25% with the Indian Overseas Bank as most of the gold is raw and the bank will spend to refine it. The, so that, and that's the one, that's the deposit that's in question. The temple is wanting, they want gold is the bottom line. Is they want gold as for payment instead of cash for the deposit of their gold. Well, Rory, this is almost too funny. And it's just a matter of, of where do we start? Uh, going back to what we've talked about before with this gold deposit scam, the, the reason we knew it was fraud right from the instant it was announced it's because of what the bankers have been telling us for years and years and years, quote unquote, gold generates no income. So, of course, the moment anybody offers to, quote unquote, pay interest on something that generates no income, we're dealing with fraud. There could never be a legitimate purpose to enter into a transaction where you borrow something that generates no income, but pay interest on it. So we start with the basic fraudulent premise. So now. Of course, the original scheme is you deposit your gold and you can get paid paper interest. And of course, that was a really good laugh because the gold is valuable. The gold is in very, exists in very finite quantities. The paper is worthless. The paper exists in infinite quantities. Give us something valuable and we'll give you a little bit of something worthless in, in return. Ha, ha, ha. So now we get to this new wrinkle. And it, of course, it's still obvious fraud because if you can't even pay paper interest on gold, how could you ever pay gold interest on gold? Uh, what, are, what are, is the government of India planning on doing with the gold it takes on deposit? Is it going to plant it in the ground and grow gold trees? Because <laughs> unless, it's going to, unless it's going to do that, it cannot pay gold interest, quote unquote, on the deposited gold. So we're, we're at an even more ludicrous level of fraud. But it, then in addition to this, we also have the time element, which you carefully pointed out that this requirement of paying gold interest only occurs with respect to longer term deposits going out three years and beyond. So there's uh, either you know, one of two ways of looking at this. Either this, this scam 
is only intended to last for three years and they're going to steal as much gold as they can during that window and then announce when, when people start to expect their gold interest that, oh yeah, well, sorry, there's nothing left in the kitty. Or the other possibility is that the uh, temple itself is complicit in this and is simply uh, agreeing to this transaction knowing the terms will never be honored down the road. So they're just playing along to get along. They yeah, get, they're, they and, get, and, they've been handed something in the back that is not, or in the background that is not being discussed. Well, and of course, it, it could be either a bribe or it could be intimidation. As you know from before, when the Indian government discussed uh, prying some gold out of the temples, uh, their idea was to quote unquote send in the bankers. Exactly. <laughs> so. You know, uh, apparently they're considered to be extremely persuasive, and, and we all know how the big banks like to engage in persuasion. <laughs> uh, yeah. What what gets me is is that you, you keep referring to it as a scam, and, and it's actually it's a scheme, Jeff. It's the gold <laughs> monetization scheme. That's the name of the program. <laughs> well, and of course, I, I've had a, a good laugh at, at that on many occasions. Uh, pointing out that the conspirators couldn't even invent a more reputable sounding aim for their scam and to call it a scheme. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I marveled at that. I, I, you know, who has the audacity to propose something which is openly fraudulent on its very surface and then title it a scheme? Exactly. I mean, it's, how can I mean they may as well just call it you know the gold monetization fraud or are the we steal gold we steal gold <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness which is pretty much what's happening and I want to I want to kind of look at silver uh, for a minute there there seems to be a, a lot of chatter about silver uh, recently and in particular about silver going much higher during 2016 and what does your research show Jeff I mean are you on board with that idea or how do you see silver playing out in the short term being the next few months or the more longer term being the, the rest of the year well I, I look at, at this as being once again totally surreal uh, as you know uh, my own prognosis and what's taking place currently in bullion markets over the short term is that we're in the middle of a fake rally. And uh, my premise for that is really simple. Uh, as we've seen metals prices advance, the price of gold has been leading the price of silver. But in any legitimate precious metals rally, the price of silver always leads the price of gold. This is a rule of precious metals markets for a very simple reason because by dollar value the silver market is much much smaller than the gold market so it only requires a microscopic amount of capital in proportion to push the silver price higher and uh, given current parameters with the current gold silver price ratio at an ultra absurd 80 to 1 level that means that if only 2% of the money entering this sector was going into silver silver would have to lead the way as a matter of simple arithmetic. Meanwhile, as, as you uh, recently pointed out in an interview with the esteemed Eric Sprott, in the real world, with real physical silver, we see silver being purchased at a 50 to 1 ratio to gold. In other words, uh, far more than just 2% of the money going into silver, we see well over 25% of the money going into silver. And, that, so not and, that's, held, and that's held for some time now. It's been yeah, at that this, level for a long time. Exactly. This is, this is a, uh, an established trend that at least 25% of the money going into the sector is going into silver. And at one point when things really heated up a year or so ago, the total amount of money going into physical silver was actually greater than the total amount of money going into physical gold. So when we see the bankers' fraudulent paper markets and we're told gold is leading the way, implying that less than 2% of the money entering that sector is going into silver, I say that's obvious fraud. And of course, the motive for the fraud is, as your audience probably remembers from our prior chats, I'm convinced that the next crash is nearly upon us. And the last thing the bankers want to do is to allow gold and silver to be seen as a safe haven. 
So those markets will be crashed with everything else. Now, However, are, they, are, is that what's, are we seeing that today? Because, I mean, they're hitting gold and silver have been hit pretty substantially. I mean, gold is currently down in almost $24, which is uh, close to 2%. And then silver is down over 60 cents an ounce, which is about 4%. I pondered that question when I looked at metals prices this morning, and my internal answer was, I don't know. And it's simply a matter of, of, you know, we can't judge off of one day. It is definitely a possibility that this this minute rally we've seen is going to be the, the high point for metals prices, and then they're going to launch their crash. As I was going to add a minute ago, the reason it's important to march metals prices higher over the short term, even though they're planning on crashing them, is because of that fact, if you want to crash metals prices, but they're already at bargain basement levels, then you have to march them up a bit first if you want to give them a really good crash. So it's take them up so you can push them down even harder and faster. And and maybe that harder and faster push down is starting today. My, my sense is that it's still a little premature. My sense is this will be a, a, a false takedown, if you will, and then we'll see metals prices quickly bounce up again and resume their, their pseudo rally. And, and the actual takedown will occur a few weeks further down the road. But, but here, I mean, this is getting into the realm of speculation. It's certainly a possibility that the takedown could have started today. Uh, but I, I suspect a more likely time frame would be about four to six weeks from now. Now, what, and what is that based on? Well, my anticipation for the next crash itself is sometime between April and June. The crash in metals prices could occur slightly prior to that, so that uh, the sheep in the markets are able to see gold and silver falling first, and then right after that everything falls, or the crashes could occur concurrently, and just everything goes down together. Either one of those scenarios would suit the banker's agenda. So if they want the metals prices to go down slightly ahead of the overall crash, then that could be what we're seeing today. But, but I, I think it suits their plans equally to have everything go down together because then they don't have to explain why metals prices are going down. Instead, they can just wait for the panic and then invent any old reason they want when people have stopped thinking. Okay, that makes sense. And so you see this being tied to the, all of the commodities market, the equities markets. What, what, what are you referencing there as far as the bigger crash? Of course, Precious metals are commodities themselves. Right. And what we've seen in this bubble and crash cycle, which is different from the bubble and crash cycle of 2001 to 2008, is that in that previous cycle, we saw commodities prices entering a spiral just before the crash began. What we've seen in this bubble and crash cycle is if you go back to 2011, we had commodity markets heating up again. And left alone, they would have gone into an even greater spiral because, of course, as we know, the money printing has been far more extreme and excessive in this bubble and crash cycle. It's the money printing that creates inflation. And, of course, that inflation is supposed to translate directly into the prices of hard assets. So in 2011, by the time they finally had their HFT trading manipulation fully perfected, they took that to commodities markets, and they took the entire commodity spectrum down, marched it steadily lower. And in fact, I wrote a, a prior piece on that where we can see all commodity markets moving upward in a trend up to 2011. And then even while we're supposedly being told that our economies are, quote unquote, recovering, we see all the commodity markets being marched downward for no valid fundamental reason. It simply was because suppressing the commodity prices not only helps to uh, hide the general inflation trend, but suppressing the prices themselves reduces actual inflation since these commodities are inputs into all of our manufacturing. They, of course, they suppress the price of commodity inputs, and, and as we also know, wages are being suppressed. In real dollars, wages keep going lower and lower. So if you manipulate input prices lower, and if you manipulate wages lower, then you, the, finish, the price for finished goods is also much lower than it would be legitimately. So this is another way to hide inflation is by uh, artificially reducing the price of finished goods through this extreme campaign of manipulation. 
when I was speaking, when Dave and I interviewed uh, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, he was saying that John Williams over at Shadow Stats is reporting uh, inflation at about 8.4%, which is a far cry from the 2% or less that the, that we are fed. Personally, I but think you- that it's even higher than that. I, I mean, I know that his, I know that his model his model looks at, at at everything, whereas I'm just looking at the things that are in my house, and the things that are in my house seem to be on a on a slightly higher trend than 8.4 percent. Well, let me address that uh, from two different perspectives. Uh, first of all, there there is of course one other manipulation factor which enters into this equation, which I didn't discuss. Uh, earlier, and that's the manipulation of currencies. So, of course, in your case, uh, it's a positive variable. The U.S. dollar has been manipulated to an ultra-extreme level, and that's another way of suppressing inflation within the U.S. economy. You know, make your currency ridiculously overpriced, and then everything else is looks cheaper in comparison. So, uh, from that perspective, I, I would say, well, uh, you know, put your faith in John Williams' numbers. But, of course, what it means uh, for people uh, in Canada, where I am, and, and elsewhere in the West, is that inflation is much worse because our currencies are taking on the chin, uh, falling, have, falling and have fallen at the precipitous rate, and thus definitely uh, inflation outside of the U.S. is far, far above that 8.4% 8, 8.4% level. But let me also address one other somewhat smaller point with respect to John Williams' work. And of course, once again, we both know he's a scrupulously honest individual, so there's no possible question at all of him budging numbers. Exactly. But but at the same time, I see a slight uh, bias in his work, a, a totally inadvertent bias, and it's simply because of the fact that he, his methodology is to always calculate statistics in the same way they've always been calculated. That's how he produces his, his own consistency. And, of course, that's, that's part of the reason his work is valid. Except, when it comes to inflation, in order to calculate the correct rate of inflation, you have to start with a correct basket of goods. Because that's what the inflation calculation is based upon. It's based upon a fixed basket of goods rather than all of the goods that exist in the universe. Because, of course, that's, it would be impossible to construct an ind- index that broad. So no matter who's calculating inflation, whether it's the liars in government or someone honest like John Williams, they have to choose a basket of goods. So John Williams' approach has been to use the same basket that was used 30, 40 years ago. And of course, there's obvious reasons for him doing so to to maintain validity in his work. But at the same time, the problem with that approach is that between 30 years and now, the standard of living for most of the people in the Western world has fallen precipitously. And what that translates into is that our basket of goods that we're purchasing today is significantly different than the basket of goods that was being purchased in years past. Specifically, a much higher percentage of our diminishing incomes goes into food and housing versus any previous time in our societies when as a more affluent population, we only required a much smaller portion of our income to go to food and housing. So instead of it being, say, 30% 30 years ago, for the average person, it's probably more like 60% today. So if you do not weight the basket of goods more heavily in favor of food and shelter today, then your basket will not be accurate. More particularly, as we know, it is food and shelter prices that have soared in an insane spiral over the last three years, while the prices for other goods have been more modest because of the dynamics I was mentioning to you previously. So in order for a basket of goods to be a perfectly accurate gauge of inflation today, that basket must be altered to include a lot more food items and a a much larger shelter component than the basket of years gone by. And so in that respect, John Williams' calculation, although it's entirely honest, would understate U.S. inflation for most people to a certain degree because most people spend much more on food than than what is implied by the basket of goods that John Williams uses in his calculation. And that makes perfect sense. And that's why... 
when I what I the comment that I made a moment ago as far as what I'm experiencing in my home, I'm equating that to food specifically. Yeah, you have a real basket. You go out to shop in the real world and you fill up your real basket and that basket is not the same one that John Williams is basing his calculation upon. So your observations of the world around you are honest and accurate. John Williams' calculation is honest and accurate as far as it goes, but it's based upon a basket that does not apply to as many people as it used to. Now, the example you used was, you know, 30 years ago, the housing and food made up 30%, and today it makes up 60%. I mean, I know that that was just for uh, demonstration, but how would that impact the overall, I mean, as far as the as far as what John Williams, the numbers that he uses, and, and this is not intended as an attack on his work at all, so please don't anyone think that. That's not what we're doing. Um, but it was, if it is 50% or 100% higher, which is what you're saying, would that translate to, you know, instead of it being 8.4, it would be like 17? No, no, definitely not. We're, we're okay. definitely talking about a much more subtle uh, bias here. So it's not like the difference between U.S. inflation and Canadian inflation. It's more along the lines of perhaps his, his, his calculation is 20% below where it should be, perhaps 25% below. Uh, the thing is here, as you know, Rory, I'm the, the anti-economist. The so, anti-economist. <laughs> so so I, don't, I don't work uh, in, in sort of the, the careful, methodical manner of a John Williams. You know, here's somebody who meticulously goes to the raw data and collects it all himself and spends an enormous amount of time in the data collection process. And I salute him for that because uh, we need uh, that work to be done or we would have no reference points at all to work with. Um, my own approach, you know, is a lot more ad hoc. Uh, I'm a big picture guy, so I, I base my own analysis more on, on trends and, and, and to some extent generalities. So I am not precisely familiar with the basket of goods John Williams is using, so I could not say to you, well, Rory, his calculation should be, uh, you know, 15% higher than it is. In other words, it should be about 10% or okay. it should be 25% higher, so it should be about, you know, 11 or 12%. Uh, it, it's a matter of there's there's a slight understatement in his his accounting because of, of the difference in, in in baskets of goods, but I don't think it's a huge difference, and so it's more along those lines of it feels worse to you because it is worse, but there's not a huge gulf between John Williams's estimates versus your own perceptions at this point. Gotcha. It, it, I think I suspect the gulf will grow greater as our, our standard of living falls further and our basket of goods is skewed even more heavily towards food and shelter, but that's going to be an ongoing process. So, for instance, if we go back five years ago, there would have been a very, very small bias in John Williams' basket of goods. That bias is slowly and steadily growing over time. I want to change gears completely. The, the attack just happened in Brussels, Belgium yesterday. I when it, when I first heard about it, the only thing I could think was another false flag, and whether it pans out that way, more than likely it will. How do how do you see the remainder of of twenty sixteen playing out as far as the economy, as far as these, as far as what Trump and Sanders are doing with the presidential uh, election? the U.S. presidential election and bringing all of these people, all of these very angry people into the fold and the situation that happened in Brussels. I mean, I don't see all of these as being disconnected. I see them as all being very connected. No, and, and my own perspective is very similar. And and my approach is, is the same approach that we're always supposed to take whenever we look at any sort of crime. The exact approach that our law enforcement officials take when they look at any sort of crime. And the first question they ask themselves is, who has the motive? And of course, one of the best ways to determine who has the motive for any crime is to ask the second question, who benefits the most from that crime? And of course, when it comes to any of these so-called, quote-unquote, terrorist attacks, there is only one 
entity or, or collection of entities that we can see who benefits from these attacks, and it's our own governments. Because every time they tell us there's another terrorist attack, what comes immediately after that is more of their fascist laws. Oh, we need to pass these laws to protect you. How convenient. If, they were, if there weren't any terrorist attacks, there would be no pretext for all of this extra protection, quote unquote. Right. So, I mean, this is, it, it's hard to illustrate a motive that's any more obvious than that. And, of course, this is why the false flag attack has been a standard uh, tool for governments going back centuries and, and no government more than the United States. So, you know, th this is why it, it frustrates me that uh, the concept of the false flag attack is still something that, that penetrates the general public very, very little, if at all. There's, there's such an obvious reason for governments to engage in this sort of heinous, deceptive behavior. It's happened over and over again throughout history. Why aren't people looking at it today? Well, of course, you know, we can answer that in one word, brainwashing. And there you have it. Now, are, are we setting the table for the cover-up of the collapse? Is that what we're seeing with Paris just a few few months ago? And now Brussels, which Paris was obviously... And, and I have to say, any time that I hear the word ISIS, the first thing that I think is CIA. Because who created uh, ISIS? Who funds, trains, and arms ISIS? The CIA, period. It's well documented. And so when I hear that, it's like, okay. And like I said, Paris... And now Belgium, a little bit bigger. And I personally believe that something else, even slightly larger, is coming within the next 60 to 90 days, which has been about that same time frame since Paris happened. And that, that we're building toward these criminals to unleash something much larger in order to cover up the actual crime of collapsing the system. I, I certainly agree with what you're saying and, and fear what you're saying. But, but let me just add a little bit to what you were saying about ISIS, because it's more than just a matter of this large and mounting pile of evidence that shows that ISIS was a deliberate construction of the U.S. government. What we're seeing here is the repetition of a pattern. And all we have to do is go back to Afghanistan, uh, go back 30 years to when the Soviet Union originally invaded Afghanistan, at which time the CIA created the Mujahideen to act as freedom fighters, quote unquote, and guerrilla fighters against the Russians. Because, of course, when you carry out terrorist attacks against the Russians, you're not a terrorist, you're a freedom fighter. So the war in Russia ends, and then all of a sudden the Mujahideen are rebranded as, quote unquote, Al Qaeda. Well, they were on the CIA payroll right up to the day they became Al-Qaeda. Is there any reason for us to expect they left the payroll? Well, of course not, given that they performed an incredibly useful function for the U.S. government, which people know today as 9-11. So what we're seeing here is an exact duplication of that pattern. We know that the original funding of these thugs and mercenaries came from the U.S. government. We see the pattern that's led from that point. Originally, they were once again freedom fighters. They were freedom fighters when they were in Libya. And originally, they were even supposed to be freedom fighters when they were in Syria. And then at some rather nebulous point, all of a sudden, they're the enemy again. And it's the exact same Mujahideen to Al-Qaeda transformation we saw in the previous cycle, except it's a little bit muddier. Well, but in, in Libya is when uh, Al-Qaeda... Al Qaeda morphed into ISIS, and Al Qaeda became the became our friend, and ISIS became our enemy. And then it got really disturbing and very muddy when ISIS was walking across Iraq, slaughtering people in city after city. And with all of the U.S. military that is still in Iraq, 
the question becomes how how is that even possible without somebody saying let this let this pass let these guys pass i mean there was about 10,000 of them at that time 10 to 12,000 were the numbers this was 2 years ago maybe not even i mean it was it's ridiculous and fortunately we got an answer to that question from russia Russia surprised the West. They moved their own forces into Syria. They launched their own attacks against ISIS and immediately rolled back this paper tiger. So, you know, what we saw was Russia being able to, in a matter of weeks, deploy its forces into a new theater and immediately chalk up decisive victories against these supposedly invincible terrorists whom the U.S. Army was supposedly impotent in, uh, in fighting. And, and, and so, as you say, this, this is absolutely farcical. How could the world's only superpower be completely impotent against a, a, ba a band of lightly armed thugs, but yet uh, Russia could uh, roll in its creaking and decrepit war machine and immediately roll them back? There, there's no logical answer for that. It was yet another illustration of this totally false paradigm. The only way that ISIS could survive with the U.S. Army standing around watching it as if the U.S. Army was standing around watching it, if not actively helping it. Exactly. I mean, and, that, and I'm glad that you said that because that's the other part that is, now, even to the most illiterate person out there, if you have, especially American citizens, if you look at the situation with ISIS, and we're supposed to be this massive you know, God-fearing, superpower, military of the world, why can we not defeat a group of ragtag, you know, people that are supposedly cave dwellers? I mean, let's, let's put this in proper perspective. I mean, we're supposed to have all of these technological, you know, super advanced weapons and but yet we can't we can't find locate and dislodge a group of people that are hanging out in caves that don't even make sense how can and, that and, how can that add up and it's just another aspect of the absurdity on the one hand we have the mainstream propaganda machine continually uh belittling and dehumanizing these supposed terrorists with the metaphor, of course, that you've used about them, you know, quote unquote, living in caves and and pro projecting them as the most primitive barbarians. And yet we have the most sophisticated war machine the world has ever seen, uh, not able to be one step ahead of supposed primitive barbarians. And it, it's it, it's utter utter absurdity. Uh, of course, we know uh, the power and potency of the surveillance machine that's been trained on our own populations. We have exactly. total big brother system where uh, an ant can't cross uh, a road without its its movement being spotted and recorded. And yet, with this same technological capability, which can be projected to any part in the world, we have the U.S. government feigning impotence. In, in dealing with this, uh, you know, minor cabal of, of thugs and mercenaries. It's, it's total absurdity from every possible angle of examination. But as we were getting to before, as you were getting to before, the purpose of creating this false paradigm could very, very easily be as a pretext for another war based on some new 9-11 or some other fabricated event. I think it's coming. I mean, I, you know, because like I said, you had Paris. Actually, you could argue going all the way back to San Bernardino and then Paris, obviously, and uh, now Brussels, you know, and each one has gotten a, gotten more violent and a little bit larger in scale. And now, so where does it go? I mean, it just seems like it's kind of escalating and escalating and escalating until... You know, and, and with Russia saying that we're done. We're done with Syria. We did what we said we were going to do. We're pulling out. But don't think that we're gone. 
because we can we can get right back in there quote in a matter of hours and be right back where where we were so you know we we've set everything up for you guys so let's deal with it make it happen but, but let me just backtrack a little further here to review the history when when this phony war on terror was first invented after the 9-11 false flag event uh, we were told very clearly why the US war machine was being cut loose to rampage around the world and and George jr. put it in very simple terms for us we're fighting them over there so we don't have to fight them over here and of course along with that mantra for the first several years of this phony war the only events which ever occurred within the West which was supposedly being protected because the US Army was rampaging everywhere else were attacks that were quote unquote caught at the last minute and we had a string of these supposed almost terrorist attacks and of course in every single case it was the most comical wannabes who were the supposed terrorists and, and the attacks they were planning were, were juvenile if not infantile and you know the the possibility of any of these feeble uh, quote unquote terrorist attacks succeeding was almost nil and you know we had a, a long string of these silly almost attacks for several years unfortunately as is the case with any form of lying and propaganda and deception you can't continue to use the same forms of lies over and over again eventually the almost attacks no longer had any effect on us we no longer would believe the war on terror was real simply because of these comical almost attacks and so they had to escalate things they had to start creating a real body count they had to start murdering people here and not just pretending they were about to murder them and so th now we've seen the escalation to successful terrorist attacks in our regimes apparently whenever the terrorists feel like it and th then of course we have to ask ourselves the question why were we ever fighting them over there quote unquote if we couldn't stop them from coming over here quote unquote all we would accomplish by dropping bombs on the heads of millions and millions of Muslims again and again and again is to make them angry and this brings us to the other aspect of fighting any form of terrorism if you want to be successful against terrorism you treat it as a crime and you use the police against the terrorists in order to engage in surgical strike enforcement because that's the way the police work the police don't drop bombs right if you want to create terrorism you turn the army loose against it because the army by definition is not capable of that sort of surgical correction of, of, of problems they do drop bombs and so if you turn the army loose against quote-unquote terrorism the only possible outcome is more terrorism so the moment that our corrupt governments announced that they were going to exclusively treat terrorism as a military matter and exclusively use their armies to combat it with the police in a subordinate role we knew that the goal of these corrupt regimes was not to stop terrorism it was to create terrorism so the war on terror was in fact the war to create terror correct I mean that's and and saying once again I want to go back to what Trump and Sanders are doing and, and in particular Donald Trump love him hate him doesn't matter to me vote for him don't vote for him I don't I really don't care what I'm concerned with is what he's saying and what he is saying is we need to stop this we need we need to we need to get a handle on on this war on terror we need to get a handle on our on at home we need to get a handle on our base on the United States and forget this other stuff and we need to talk to Putin and we need to talk to these other world leaders and not just drop bombs on them I mean so I think that that plays into the escalation of what we're seeing right now because if if my theory is holds any water then they're going to have to speed up their timelines 
and a lot of people are, are saying that we're not going to get to the 2016 election. And how, how do you feel about that? I mean, are you seeing or hearing anything along those lines or reading anything along those lines? Well, first, with respect to Donald Trump, I, I totally understand your own perspective, and my perspective is very similar. But let me uh, express it in, in, in a slightly different way. Uh, most of your audience will be familiar with the fable of the emperor's new clothes. And it's the fable about uh, a, a vain and, and corrupt emperor who gets his uh, you know, the, the finest tailor in the kingdom to supposedly weave him the finest suit of clothes. But in fact, there are no clothes. The emperor walks out naked in front of his people. And while all of the sycophants in the population are applauding the emperor's new clothes, one little boy stands up and shouts out, the emperor is wearing no clothes. And only then do the sycophants acknowledge what they're actually seeing with their own eyes. Donald Trump is that little boy. Donald Trump is continually shouting, standing up and shouting, the emperor is wearing no clothes. And he did it with regard to U.S. corruption. He's done it with respect to the phony war on terror. I was shocked to see uh, another uh, headline today. Uh, Donald Trump was saying the U.S. doesn't have any golden Fort Knox. So you know, once again, uh, this is you know the boy shouting, the emperor has no clothes. He, he's not saying anything we don't know. It's just that, for once, somebody who people will actually listen to is saying it. Exactly. And, and so he performs a very useful function in that respect, whether or not he's been corrupted, uh, whether or not, or what, regardless of what he would actually do if he, if, he, if when he gets elected, he at the moment he is the uh, little boy who's pointing out all of these things that no one else will, will say, even though it's patently obvious. And, and sorry, so uh, getting back to your general uh, uh, suggestion of what's coming, yeah, I, I don't see any reason not to look at that as the, as the probable course of events. Because, of course, when we combine this with the fact that, that there is a, a, an economic crash that's coming, it's coming very soon, the, the banksters need to reset our economy so that they can start the next bubble and crash cycle. We, we have everything lined up to expect some sort of large exogenous event, whether it's going to be a terrorist false flag attack, whether it's going to be some new plague unleashed upon us, it's going to cause you know um, massive disruption in our economies. We we can strongly suspect some sort of exogenous event, but you know we we even here we can't be 100% sure of it because of course we're projecting into the future as rational individuals. And we're not dealing with rational individuals or a rational system. Mm -hmm. Perhaps these, these psychopathic bankers uh, are so audacious that they don't even think they need to create a pretext for their next crash. And they're just simply going to do it on purely economic terms. We can't rule that out completely. It's just that there seems to have been a lot of information telegraphed that, quote unquote, something big is planned. And so when you and I look at, at the events that are unfolding, we suspect that that is what's coming next and coming soon. And it, it, it's their pattern for a couple of hundred years, if not more, is to create this huge distraction by way of war and then start to, to start resetting everything as far as economics and finance are concerned. In the fog of war. In the fog of war, exactly. When, when no one can see the, the criminals moving about when they're all watching the body count instead of watching the criminals resetting everything and, and going, well, why, why are you doing that right now when we've got this situation going on over here? we got all these people being blown up, but you're talking about doing something with the, with the money. Well, why aren't you concerned about this? And saying that's what we need. That's what we need. People that are that are going to be doing that. We need people like like Donald Trump that will say that, and people will listen to him. Because you and I can say it all day long, and and it's great. I mean, and it's great that we're going to be in, informing a few people. But that's that's where it's going to start and stop. It's going to be a few people. We'll we'll say ten thousand. 
I mean, if 10,000 people watch this video, then that's great. But that's only 10,000 where Donald Trump is reaching millions. And that's, exactly. where, that's where we need it to be. We need somebody out there that will say, why are you, to, why are you counting money when my children are dying? And that, you know, and until it, until it, until that happens, these criminals will. I, but here's what surprises um, me a little bit, Rory. If we go back to the uh, last election cycle, when Ron Paul uh, was a leading candidate, and Ron Paul was attempting to do a lot of the things Donald Trump is doing now, which is bring attention to some of the major injustices and, and major flaws in our current paradigm, what did we see the mainstream media do at that time? Well, we saw them essentially just censor Dr. Paul. Yes. They cut off his access to the media and they did everything possible to discredit him and, and to conceal everything he was trying to tell us. And so this is the part that strikes me strange with regard to the current U.S. election is either the oligarchs were caught totally off guard by the phenomenon of the Donald, or they're deliberately allowing him to vent like this. And if that's the case, I scratch my head because I don't see any clear agenda to allow something like that. Uh, you know, the, the whole point with the emperor's new clothes is it's really important to the emperor that somebody shut up that little boy before he says anything. And yet here we have the little boy allowed to stand up and shout, you know, not just once or twice, but again and again about all sorts of different things. The emperor's wearing no clothes. The emperor's lying to us. The emperor's stealing from us. Uh, you know, this just seems totally atypical, once again, talking about the patterns we're used to seeing in this paradigm of corruption. It does, it does make one scratch their head and go, what's different? Because you're absolutely right. I mean, and we're seeing some of the some of the same things play out at, during this cycle, and that happened to uh, Dr. Paul. And now, of what, course, there is. Sorry. No, I mean, he was shut out, or his delegates were shut out of the Republican National Convention in Florida. They were locked out. Created all this chaos. And now they're talking about locking out the delegates for Donald Trump or just ignoring them completely. We don't, we don't recognize them. I mean, and it's like, uh, hmm, how, 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 can you, how can you do that? How can you say that, that my vote doesn't count? And okay, now all, I'm not had, familiar with this. Sorry? No, we've had two, we've had two different people within the um, GOP to come out and say point blank that <laughs> your vote really doesn't matter. It doesn't count. We decide who, who the delegates are going to, going to choose. They've come out and said that twice. Once was okay. the first time was how, live on CNBC. And, and how recently was this Rory? About a, within the last week. Okay, very recent now. Okay, yeah, I was going to say I hadn't I hadn't picked up on that myself. So so okay, well that that could suggest then that the Donald really was a surprise which the oligarchs weren't prepared for, and now they're engaging in damage control belatedly. Um, but of course, I was going to point out there is one very key difference between, and there's many of course, but there's one very key difference between Ron Paul and Donald Trump, and that is that that Ron Paul is utterly uncorruptible. Yeah. And, of course, Donald Trump is the personification of corruption. He's just not, as far as we know, in the pocket of the same oligarchs who are controlling everything else. Well, you know, one other difference here is that different people are listening to the Donald than the people who are listening to Ron Paul. The people who are listening to Ron Paul were people like ourselves. And generally, I, I, I would dare say, the more intelligent and sophisticated segments of the U.S. population, the people who were most likely to start scratching their heads and asking themselves what's really going on here. In contrast, if we look at, at the Donald's popular support, uh, 
you know, we go right down to the level of, of the lowliest knuckle draggers. We're generally dealing with with the elements of, of our zombie populations who are, are most apathetic, least informed, and, and greatest in number. And so we have uh, the Donald appealing to a very broad segment of the population right off the bat. Whereas with Ron Paul, he was starting off with a, a smaller base of, of supporters and people who understand where he was coming from. And then there was the potential for that to mushroom into something much larger. So because of that different dynamic, it may have seemed a lot more practical to simply cut him off from, from access and starve out his campaign, whereas that may not have seemed to be as practical a strategy with someone like Donald Trump who they knew would instantly acquire a, a large following of, of the you know, lower levels of, of U.S. society. In other words, it's blown up in their face and they weren't expecting it. Yeah, it, it, was, it was something that they couldn't put a lid on as easily, so they're now looking at ways of, of managing it in a more oblique manner. And I still suspect that the ultimate solution will be for them to uh, obtain control over Trump, uh, you know, pr probably through the proverbial offer he can't refuse. Excuse me, Mr. Trump, we're prepared to offer you a choice here. You can be our highly paid servant, or you can start choosing your casket. Oh, that's kind of the the agreement that we believe that was made to uh, uh, Sirpas, the exactly. Prime Minister of Greece. Exactly. You can either stop all this nonsense, or your family may find themselves evaporated. And they managed to do it with with with, with Cyprus when we were dealing with somebody who we thought was uncorruptible. Uh, in the case of, of Donald Trump, uh, we're you know, we're dealing with let's make a deal. Uh, so you know, I I see somebody that pliable, and I don't think they that despite the outrageous things he's saying. I don't think that the oligarchs consider him to be as much of a problem, especially if immediately after they, he, he wins the election, they obtain control of him, and he starts to backtrack on some of the things he was saying previously. He gets into the Oval Office and he says to the American people, you know what, now that I'm actually here and I can look around, things aren't exactly the way I thought they were. They're not as bad as I thought they were. The U.S. isn't really that corrupt. Oh, and all of Fort Knox's gold is really there. And, and you know what? They're doing a great job of fighting the war on terror. I hope and pray that that doesn't happen. I really do. I, I just don't know how much. I just don't know how much longer the rest of the world is going to be able to deal with our corruption. And it, and if that were to play out, I think that there would be an uprising at that point. I think that the people that elected him, who are really, they're, they're very, they're, they're pissed off is what's going on. Is they're very angry at this point. They know they've been sold down the river. He's telling the American people, you were sold down the river 50 years ago. Period. Can you say NAFTA? I can. That's where, that's where you lost everything. Okay. And that's what he is reminding people of. And, and all of those people, like you said, it goes all the way down to the least educated. They are, they're, they're, they're not that stupid, you know, and, and now there's somebody that they can relate to and that, they, that they're willing to listen to that's telling them the truth. And I think that if he were to backtrack, I, I don't see that as, I don't see that playing out very well. But then we go right back to what we've been talking about for a considerable length of time, which is the very strong likelihood of some major exogenous event being launched upon us. If some new terrorist attack, quote unquote, is launched upon us, and then Donald says, you know what, now that I've looked around, we're doing a great job fighting the war on terror, then that backtracking comes across oh, as a lot more plausible. Or conversely, if, if uh, a major war is manufactured and, and then everybody is the enemy, uh, you know, there's the natural tendency uh, as, as tribal people to circle the wagons and automatically pull together. 
And if then the Donald says in an atmosphere of war where supposedly everybody is against the U.S., you know what, we're not as corrupt as I was saying. We're a lot better than that. And, uh, you know, you can trust the NSA because they were just actually trying to protect us against the Russians all along and, and, and on and on. And if there is a foreign scapegoat to point at when the Donald is making all of his mea culpas about how he was wrong before, then I think we're dealing with a very plausible scenario. Just, I just, like I said, I hope and pray to God that that doesn't happen, that that doesn't come to pass. Um, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. It really wouldn't, unfortunately, because he's been in the bed. He's been in bed with the Clintons for 30 years, 40 years. So, I mean, we know. And, and we see how easy it is for, for the propaganda machine to demonize foreign scapegoats. You know, in, in throughout the last couple of years, a, as Russia has supposedly been the new rising enemy, uh, we know that Russia has been behaving in an exemplary manner. It has shown incredible restraint in the face of, of one U.S. provocation after another. It's been a voice of reason and a peacemaker, and yet it's depicted as the exact opposite of all those things, apparently successfully, with the vast majority still. And as long as the propaganda machine is that potent, then, of course, it provides them with an enormous latitude in their choice of strategies. Unfortunately, you're probably right, because the propaganda machine is very strong. They just want their football. They just want, you know, another episode of the Kardashians and all is well. I still see the, the dancing unicorns and the rainbow, so it must be good. Don't yeah. worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. And Russia is the enemy. Yeah. Never mind that, that Putin's been the only, been one of the few voices of sanity on the global stage, but they don't hear that. No, as long as you can, you, you dumb people down with the don't worry, be happy message. And then when things finally get so bad that they begin to get restless, you manufacture a foreign scapegoat and say, that's who's responsible for all your problems. That's who you, who you should be angry at. And that's who we're going to attack. Don't you love us? Aren't we the greatest? Yeah. We're here to protect you. <laughs> we're here to protect you. The fox in the hen house. Yep. Well, Jeff, I think we've left him with uh, quite a bit to chew on. And uh, I think that's as good a point to end as any. What do you think? It's one of those scenarios where, you know, if we go on talking longer, we're just probably going to make people more depressed. <laughs> well, we don't want to do that. No, uh, we, we've done enough to cheer people up already, Rory. <laughs> well, we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Jeff Nielsen over at uh, BullionBullsCanada.com, and he also is a writer for... Uh, Sprott Money, and you can find all of this great work at, at either one of those websites. And Jeff, is there anything you want to leave them with? No, Roy, those are, are my focal points right now. Uh, I love working with Sprott Money. It's wonderful to be associated with a financial investment company that's actually uh, motivated to get the truth out to people. And, you know, fortunately, we have one of those in Canada. I'm not uh, familiar with any uh, such institutions in the U.S., but if you find one, give me their name and I'll send my resume. And, of course, it, it could be either a bribe or it could be intimidation. A as you know from before, when the Indian government discussed uh, prying some gold out of the temples, uh, their idea was to, quote-unquote, send in the bankers. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, uh, apparently they're considered to be extremely persuasive. And we all know how the big banks like to engage in persuasion. <laughs> uh, yeah. What what gets me is is that you, you keep referring to it as a scam, and, and it's actually it's a scheme, Jeff. It's the gold <laughs> monetization scheme. That's the name of the program. <laughs> well, and of course, I, I've had a, a good laugh at, at that on many occasions, uh, pointing out that the conspirators couldn't even invent a more reputable sounding aim for their scam and to call it a scheme. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I marveled at that. I, I, you know, who has the audacity to propose something which is openly fraudulent on its very surface and then title it a scheme? Exactly. I mean, it's, 
how can I mean they may as well just call it you know the gold monetization fraud or are the <laughs> we steal gold we steal gold <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness which is pretty much what's happening and I want to I want to kind of look at silver uh, for a minute there there seems to be a, a lot of chatter about silver uh, recently and in particular about silver going much higher during 2016 and what does your research show Jeff I mean are you on board with that idea or how do you see silver playing out in the short term being the next few months or the more longer term being the, the rest of the year well I, I look at, at this as being once again totally surreal uh, as you know uh, my own prognosis on what's taking place currently in bullion markets over the short term is that we're in the middle of a fake rally and uh, my premise for that is really simple uh, as we've seen metals prices advance the price of gold has been leading the price of silver but in any legitimate precious metals rally the price of silver always leads the price of gold this is a rule of precious metals markets for a very simple reason because by dollar value the silver market is much much smaller than the gold market so it only requires a microscopic amount of capital in proportion to push the silver price higher and uh, given current parameters with the current gold silver price ratio at an ultra absurd 80 to 1 level that means that if only 2% of the money entering this sector was going into silver, silver would have to lead the way as a matter of simple arithmetic. Meanwhile, as, as you uh, recently pointed out in an interview with the esteemed Eric Sprott, in the real world, with real physical silver, we see silver being purchased at a 50 to 1 ratio to gold. In other words, uh, far more than just 2% of the money going into silver, we see well over 25% of the money going into silver. And, that, so not and, that's only, held, and that's held for some time now. It's been yeah, at that this, level for a long time. Exactly. This is, this is a, uh, an established trend that at least 25% of the money going into the sector is going into silver. And at one point when things really heated up a year or so ago, the total amount of money going into physical silver was actually greater than the total amount of money going into physical gold. So when we see the bankers fraudulent paper markets and we're told, gold is leading the way, implying that less than 2% of the money entering that sector is going into silver, I say that's obvious fraud. And, and of course, the motive for the fraud is, as your audience probably remembers from our prior chats, I'm convinced that the next crash is nearly upon us, and the last thing the bankers want to do is to allow gold and silver to be seen as a safe haven. So those markets will be crashed with everything else. Now, However, are, they, is that what's, are we seeing that? today because I mean they're hitting gold and silver have been hit pretty substantially I mean gold is currently down in you know, almost twenty four dollars which is uh, close to two percent and then silver is down over sixty cents an ounce which is about four percent I, I pondered that question when I looked at metals prices this morning and my internal answer was I don't know and it's simply a matter of, of you know we can't judge off of one day it is definitely a possibility that this this minute rally we've seen is going to be the, the high point for metals prices and then they're going to launch their crash. As I was going to add a minute ago, the reason it's important to march metals prices higher over the short term, even though they're planning on crashing them, is because of that fact. If you want to crash metals prices but they're already at bargain basement levels, then you have to march them up a bit first if you want to give them a really good crash. So it's take them up so you can push them down even harder and faster. And, and maybe that harder and faster push down is starting today. My, my sense is that it's still a little premature. My sense is this will be a, uh, a false takedown. Rory, this is almost too funny. And it's just a matter of, of where do we start. Uh, going back to what we've talked about before with this gold deposit scam, the, the reason we knew it was fraud right from the instant it was announced is because of what the bankers have been telling us for years and years and years quote unquote gold generates no income so of course the moment anybody offers to quote unquote pay interest on something that generates no income we're dealing with fraud 
there could never be a legitimate purpose to enter into a transaction where you borrow something that generates no income but pay interest on it. So we start with the basic fraudulent premise. So now, of course, the original scheme is you deposit your gold and you get paid paper interest. And of course, that was a really good laugh because the gold is valuable. The gold is in very, exists in very finite quantities. The paper is worthless. The paper exists in infinite quantities. Give us something valuable and we'll give you a little bit of something worthless in, in return. Ha, ha, ha. So now we get to this new wrinkle. And it, of course, it's still obvious fraud because if you can't even pay paper interest on gold, how could you ever pay gold interest on gold? Uh, what are, what are, is the government of India planning on doing with the gold it takes on deposit? Is it going to plant it in the ground and grow gold trees? Because <laughs> unless, unless it's going to do that, it cannot pay gold interest, quote unquote, on the deposited gold. So we're, we're at an even more ludicrous level of fraud. But it, then in addition to this, we also have the time element, which you carefully pointed out that this requirement of paying gold interest only occurs with respect to longer term deposits going out three years and beyond. So there's uh, either you know, one of two ways of looking at this. Either this, this scam is only intended to last for three years and they're going to steal as much gold as they can during that window and then announce when, when people start to expect their gold interest that, oh yeah, well, sorry, there's nothing left in the kitty. Or the other possibility is that the uh, temple itself is complicit in this and is simply uh, agreeing to this transaction knowing the terms will never be honored down the road. So they're just playing along to get along. They yeah. Get, they, they and, get, they've been handed something in the back that is not, or in the background, that is not being discussed. Well, and if you will, and then we'll see metals prices quickly bounce up again and resume their, their pseudo rally, and, and the actual takedown will occur a few weeks further down the road. But, but here, I mean, this is getting into the realm of speculation. It's certainly a possibility that the takedown could have started today, uh, but I, I suspect a more likely time frame would be about four to six weeks from now. Now, what, and what is that based on? Well, my anticipation for the next crash itself is sometime between April and June. The crash in metals prices could occur slightly prior to that so that uh, the sheep in the markets are able to see gold and silver falling first and then right after that everything falls or the crashes could occur concurrently and just everything goes down together. Either one of those scenarios would suit the banker's agenda. So if they want the metals prices to go down slightly ahead, of the overall crash, then that could be what we're seeing today. But but I, I think it suits their plans equally to have everything go down together because then they don't have to explain why metals prices are going down. Instead, they can just wait for the panic and then invent any old reason they want when people have stopped thinking. Okay, that makes sense. And so you see this being tied to the, all of the commodities market, the equities markets. What 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 are you referencing there? as far as the bigger crash? Of course, precious metals are commodities themselves. Right. And what we've seen in this bubble and crash cycle, which is different from the bubble and crash cycle of 2001 to 2008, is that in that previous cycle, we saw commodities prices entering a spiral just before the crash began. What we've seen in this bubble and crash cycle is if you go back to 2011, we had commodity markets heating up again, and left alone, they would have gone into an even greater spiral because, of course, as we know, the money printing has been far more extreme and excessive in this bubble and crash cycle. It's the money printing that creates inflation, and, of course, that inflation is supposed to translate directly into the prices of hard assets. So in 2011, by the time they finally had their HFT trading manipulation fully perfected, they took that to commodities markets, and they took the entire commodity spectrum down, marched it steadily lower. And in fact, I wrote a, a prior piece on that where we can see all commodity markets moving upward in a trend up to 2011. And then even while we're supposedly being told that our economies are quote unquote recovering, we see all the commodity markets being marched downward for no 
valid fundamental reason. He agreed to a three-year term. Okay, so this is this is definitely escalating because, of course, the original thing I heard was a hundred pounds. <laughs> no, this was this was just released by, uh, like I said, by Reuters, and the second leg is to deposit one point four tons for up to for between uh, three and fifteen years. But the but the catch is is that the temple has said we'll do that, but we don't want money, we want gold. <laughs> so they're they're giving they're giving a lot of pushback. Here's the opening paragraph: The world's richest Hindu temple is asking to be repaid in gold for longer-term deposits it makes under the Indian government's monetization scheme in order to make the plan more attractive to the temples that are sitting on thousands of tons of metal. The Swami Temple, popularly known as uh, Tiratupa, has requested repayment of their deposits on longer than three years under the gold monetization scheme in the metal rather than cash, the executive director told Reuters on Wednesday. That's so if it's more than three years, we want metal. We don't want your we don't want your rupees because they're worthless. And I want to read this last part, and then you can then you can uh, reply if you would. Sure. Since the temple will deposit, now wait a minute. Uh, TTD, which there is the temple, last month deposited 1.3 tons of gold with the state-run national bank at a rate of 1.75 percent for three years, and then the temple will deposit another 1.4 tons in a fortnight at 1.25 percent with the Indian Overseas Bank, as most of the gold is raw and the bank will spend to refine it. The, so, that and that's the one, that's the deposit that's in question. The temple is wanting, they want gold, is the bottom line. Is they want gold as for payment instead of cash for the deposit of their gold. 